It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Franco Moretti's second lecture uh, here at King's after the, what was the, a phenomenal tour de force on Abi Warburg's uh, Passos Formel uh, earlier this month. Uh, so tonight he's going to talk to us about a different topic, day and night on the counterpoint of Western and film noir. And while at King's, um, Franco has also offered a full seminar for attended by King's students and staff uh, on, on the tragedy, sovereignty, uh, uh, um, uh, so tragedy, sovereign, sovereignty, and dictatorship. And um, I, I speak for myself, but I think this is a view shared by many who, if not all of those who have attended the seminar or attending the seminar, uh, that it has been an exhilarating experience uh, to, to, be, to be part of it. Um, and reading Franco's work and interacting with, with him one can get the impression of a, a well-organized mind that thinks through questions of its own devising uh, and, and, and works out complex problems. Uh, and this is to say that Franco is both, um, I think, an original uh, and a systematic thinker, uh, has striking, um, um, revealing intuitions but also is able to build a structure around them, put them to work and share them with others. Uh, while well, I think the majority of people are good at one thing or, or the other um, on, a, on, a, on a good day, on a lucky day. <laughs> um, so uh, as many of you will know, he's a scholar of, of uh, um, astonishing range. Uh, most famously, his, work, his most famous work has been on the modern novel, but yeah, he's also done groundbreaking, um, game-changing research on epic drama, art history, and as we will see today, um, film. And the trait d'union is, as, as, as far as I can see, uh, interest in what he calls um, uh, the politics of form, or a, or a politically oriented formalism that seeks to define how the structure, structures of social power are inscribed as well as challenged by, uh, by, by aesthetic forms. But um, just as important as Franco's method uh, is his style. Uh, his readings of literature communicate a strong feeling for an understanding of beauty, uh, imagination, as well as being quite open about the margins of error and ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, and, and this is why this is why we don't we don't have to worry when he shows us graphs uh, and diagrams, uh, because he's he's uh, he's still human, I think. So um, um, that's all I have to say. Uh, so um, please join me in welcome in welcoming um, uh, Professor Moretti for for his uh, lecture tonight. Oh, I should. I should also say that we will have a chance to ask questions after the talk, and there will be two roving mics, uh, so um, you know people should grab the mic before they ask their question. Thank you so much, uh, Rosa, and uh, all of you, for inviting me and for being here. Uh, two words to explain the. Uh, or the origin and the point of today's talk. This is going to be part of a short book. Uh, the idea for the book arose while I was teaching uh, a year ago, last spring, in at Stanford. And at a certain point, I realized this could be, and it turned out indeed to be, my last course in the United States. And uh, I thought, this is so strange. We, it was an undergraduate course. It was an undergraduate introductory course for first and second year students on uh, um, British and American literature, 1850 to the present. And uh, it occurred to me, it, it's, it's so strange. We spend so much time preparing these type of lectures, studying, taking notes, et cetera, et cetera. Then we give the lecture, and uh, there are 20 students, 30. They listen. They leave. And, uh, and then the talk disappears. We seldom uh, in publish undergraduate teaching. It's uh, more the graduate seminars and uh, uh, activities 
that end up being published. And this made me think, well, what exact, why exactly is this? Uh, you have a room full of intelligent 20 years old in front of you. You try, you know, I mean, not that I much care what they're going to do with their life, but you try to uh, um, explain to them as well as you can um, what can be interesting about the history of literature, of culture, um, of art, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what is there that one can add to what you're trying to convey to an intelligent 20 years old that makes the piece suddenly worthy of being published? And I understand there is, you know, the whatever um, state of the art confrontation with uh, current scholarship, but uh, is that really, is that really, or, so I decided, okay, let's try and see what happens if I try to write five of these talks. The course was uh, conceived as 19 discontinuous single lectures on different arguments, and so I picked five, all of them on American culture, and uh, uh, and I'm now beginning to uh, work at them. So don't be, uh, I hope this will not seem, uh, you know, I, I, this will be a synthesized um, um, uh, version of what I uh, gave my class a year ago at Stanford. The second thing is uh, that uh, Whereas, uh, when I started working, there was an enormous uh, and perhaps excessive respect or halo, intellectual halo, around literature. It was considered, you know, an, an, an extremely uh, high endeavor uh, achievement of human culture. And so, uh, uh, several people, um, I was one of them, felt that the most urgent task was that of debunking this almost religious halo around literature. Nowadays, there is no halo at all. <laughs> and uh, 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 even though the critical aspect remains important for me, um, I realized that uh, uh, before engaging in the criticism, one had to try and recreate for a new generation. Uh, not exactly the halo that existed half a century ago, of course, but some kind of uh, one. And so um, there will be an element of that here. I will not be uh, shy with claiming greatness or great interest for some of the things. I, I objectively think they are, but you know, um, there is also this uh, almost, let's say, pedagogic aspect to it. So, so the first thing I do on film, and uh, so you know, there is that element uh, that's always uh, kind of exciting, but. It, also means that uh, one is uh, uh, on uncharted territory. And so, here we go. This is uh, uh, John Ford's stagecoach, and uh, the journey has begun. And uh, uh, as you can see, we see this Monument Valley, the uneven terrain, the buttes, the horizon, the clouds in the sky. It's uh, uh, a sort of the typical uh, uh, landscape of uh, the Western, and it's filmed with the typical shot of the Western, which is the long shot, a way of filming that makes a landscape look even uh, larger than it turns it into the protagonist of the film, in a sense. And here is double indemnity, exactly the opposite uh, situation. Stanwyck and McMurray are meeting to plan their next moves against the insurance company. They're meeting inside a supermarket in uh, uh, the most urban imaginable space. It's a very crowded space. Boxes, cans, commodities everywhere. Customers, there is a lady who buys some baby formula. It's a very crowded space, made even more crowded by the shot that is typical of film noir, which is the close-up. Close-up, which, however, closeness, proximity, does not mean clarity. Uh, her sunglasses make her expressions fantastically unreadable, and it will remain like that throughout the film. It's completely uh, the reverse in the Western. 
distance of the spaces like the one we just saw. Distance makes it often difficult to see, and there is the typical scene of people sh shading their eyes or uh, sort of uh, contracting their brows, trying to figure out what is it that is happening in the distance. But, uh, you know, distance makes it difficult to see, but uh, uh, you either see or you don't see. There is no ambiguity. Here, it's all ambiguity. The Western is a, a genre of daylight, high noon. It's a genre in plein air. It's, uh, even when it was in black and white, it's as if it were waiting for color to become technically available. As soon as it did, it immediately embraced it. There are now these lurid Westerns of the 1950s with these uh, weird colors. That, but because the genre immediately realized the, uh, the utility of color, for its uh, uh, aesthetics. Not so uh, the noir, which had a, a whole passion for darkness, a passion that's revealed in uh, so many of its titles, uh, Nightfall, The Night of the Hunter, Gaslight, uh, um, Black Angel, uh, The Dark Corner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the noir remained, uh, um, remained caught with uh, rhetoric that emphasized the many gradations of black and white film. So they're contemporaries, these two great post-war genres. I will focus mostly on the period from uh, the 40s to the mid-50s. They're contemporaries, but they're also polar opposites. And today I will try to first detail the opposition, the counterpoint, and then briefly, in the end, reflect on its significance. The Western first. So, Initially, there was no such thing as the Western. The word was just an adjective that uh, helped giving some kind of local color to a whole series of genres, like Western chase films, Western comedies, romances, epics, uh, uh, and so on. But the adjective was a geographical one, and this made it very quickly more important than the nouns it was supposed to serve because geography turned out to be crucial for the new form. Think of titles, again, rivers. Red River, Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, Rio, Bra Rio Lobo, drums along the Mohawk. Uh, states or large regions, the Virginians, Texas Rangers, uh, Northwest Mounted Police. A few cities, 310 to Yuma, Veracruz, San Antonio, outposts, Fort Apache, Comanche Station, the Alamo, and a whole lexicon of terms that suggest space and movement. Destry Rides Again, The Big Trail, Canyon Passage, Stagecoach, Two Road Together, uh, The Bend in the River, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So every story needs space in order to happen, but the Western is in love with space. It really foregrounds it and turns it into the protagonist, full screen. Uh, the beginning of the cattle drive in Red River, Red River is, is a story of a huge herd of 10,000 cows moved from Texas to Missouri. And the beginning of the drive, uh, which we'll see next, uh, is a typical example of this uh, capacity of the Western to use the landscape in all sorts of ways. It begins with the, the landscape, the, with space, as narrative setting. You have the cattle and the uh, uh, um, drovers at dawn, motionless, waiting. Then uh, there is a panoramic shot so powerful that even a legendary continuity blunder, which we will see, cannot really spoil it. Then there is a sense of direction taken to Missouri math and an explosion of joy. And this is, <coughs> I hope the light is okay. Maybe there is too much light here against the. Already. 
given how the shot begins, it cannot end, as you will see it end, on John Wayne's right side. But Take him to Missouri, Matt. films are particularly good at creating uh, this sense of space. Uh, the Man of the West, a horseman appears on the horizon, looks around, and then rides calmly off. In uh, My Darling Clementine and the Virginian, it's a herd of cows that disperses slowly over the screen. In uh, Rio Bravo, Red River, the man from Laramie, it's wagons that advance cautiously this way and that. Cautiously, slowly, calmly. This is the initial tempo of the Western, lento. The first 10 minutes of Once Upon the Time in the West. Three men at the, 10 minutes, three men at a station, a, a fly buzzing, and a drop of water hitting the rim of a hat, nothing else. In no other form that I know of does waiting waiting for the train, for the attack, for the rescue, for the night, for daylight, for whatever. Waiting plays such a large role as it does here. It's like a dilation of time which echoes the enlargement of space, which is so typical of the form. The big trail, the big sky, the big country. Big and empty. Film after film, the first to set eyes on the landscape is, uh, is always a white man. And what he sees is uh, nothing. Nothing but an uninhabited country. Native Americans, Indians, as the Western uh, calls them, were of course already there in uh, the West and in all of the Americas for that matter. But uh, by routinely introducing them only after we've become already familiar with white characters, the narrative manages to make them feel like intruders, illegitimate. And seldom has fiction rewritten and in fact lied about uh, actual history so, so spectacularly as the Western has done. Cinema is a specifically epic art, wrote Andre Bazin in a famous essay on the American film, and the migration to the West is our odyssey. Epic, yes. Odyssey, no. That there is no return is the founding act of the genre. Migrations are stories of homelessness. There may be a home, maybe, but if there is one, it's in the future, elsewhere. Right now, home is a wagon, no more than that. Two, three generations together, surrounded by hundreds of other families, uh, all different and all leading exactly the same life gather from the north, the south, and the east, they assemble on the bank of the Mississippi for the conquest of the west. It's the opening title of the big trail in 1930. The conquest of the west. The tempo is still slow, but it's also become unrelenting. The wagon train has to go on. The wagon train can never stop. And this creates a pressure that intensifies the meaning of everything. People die and are buried, a hasty prayer, and then they're left behind. A baby is born, a few hours later, she's already on the move. They can never stop. And everyday life in this situation is both uh, uh, relentlessly itself, they're always making coffee, they're always mending socks, they're always washing the only shirt they have, relentlessly every day, and always unpredictably dangerous. 
dangerous uh, in part because of uh, humans. Uh, almost all great migration westerns include uh, uh, confrontations with, uh, with Indians, but especially for the enmity of nature. It's uh, always too hot, too cold, too dry, rain, wind, snow, rapids, mountains, mud. There is so much friction in these journeys. Every film, there is a wagon that gets stuck in the mud. There isn't a single scene in which they go downhill. They must have been going downhill half of the time. But the film never shows it. It's always going up. It's always an effort. In fact, seldom have characters in fiction and in film worked so much and so collectively as in these early Westerns. Uh, keeping the animals together, um, cutting down trees, crossing rivers, opening passages through hills, overcoming crazy obstacles as in this scene from, uh, uh, there should be something first, yeah from the, the big trail. This is a 1930 movie. And at a certain point, there is a cliff. And here, they're letting the wagons come down the cliff, holding them. And then there is this human chain, including children, that goes down the cliff like that. So they've worked so hard to get to the West that you cannot but feel that they really deserve it. In this respect, these wagon trains that make, that are so important in the early history of the genre, they are really, they behave like a stubborn, gigantic human herd, which is also the reason why Red River, with that incredibly unpromising storyline, 10,000 cows moving from Texas to Missouri, it doesn't seem like, you know, that, but at the same time, it is really the great metaphor for the settlers' migration. See the cattle, but they're really the settlers. And in the central episode of the film, it's a moment that's it's a terrifying stampede caused by a man who wants to eat sugar in the middle of the night and therefore makes a noise and you know the cows go crazy. The stampede is, uh, again, a metaphor for the destructive potential that sort of erupts suddenly, earthquake-like, in the middle of so this is at the beginning, so basically migration films uh, towards the West. Then uh, the Western settles in towns of one form or another. In the middle, uh, there is this miracle of stagecoach, which is, begins in a town, ends in another town, but uh, uh, the whole film is occupied by, uh, by the ride. And uh, um, I, I may say something about stagecoach later, but I have to um, um, cut a few things. Um, it's time now to turn to what could be called the, the sociology. We've seen the geography of the genre, but it, it's, it obviously also has a very clear sociological uh, component. And uh, you start seeing these films, especially the, early, the opening scenes with this vast landscape, solitary characters. and. Uh, you sort of think of Whitman's poetry. Whitman's poetry was written uh, at the beginning of the second half of the 19th century, the, uh, which is exactly the period, especially the third quarter of the 19th century, in which most Westerns are set. That is the moment of the Great Migration. Whitman is writing at the time. The Western did not exist yet, really. It began to exist a generation after Whitman in the last quarter of the century. Uh, uh, in the form of novels, of course, of dime novels. So you think of Whitman with his vignettes of sort of isolated individuals. The maid stands braced on the whale boat, lance and harpoon are ready, the duck shooter walk by silent and cautious stretches, the deacons are ordained with crossed hands at the altar, and so on. These long lists of uh, free verses, each standing independently of the other. It's a sort of it's a social parataxis. Um, social entities exist in one next to the other without any contact or interference uh, between each other. An element of that is always present in uh, the Western. And uh, it's a, pr 
promise, it's this idea uh, that, that is so typical of Whitman, of these expanding lists. This is a type of poetry, but by implication, this is also a space in which there is space for everybody. And uh, it's such a simple and uh, a great promise that it still echoes of all things in the, at the opening of Death of a Salesman. It's literally the opening caption of the uh, play, uh, which is a 1949 play. The curtain is still down, the room is dark. A melody is heard, played upon a flute. A flute. It is small and fine, telling of grass and trees and the horizon. The curtain rises. But of course, the promise is broken in Miller's play, but already in the Westerns, because these are stories of death and of killing. Killing Indians, especially at the beginning, and then later killing white outlaws. Outlaws, the genre seems to shift in its identification of the enemy. And then, of course, in the 1960s, Native Americans are completely uh, the, the view is completely it's on reversed in a sense. But um, the 40s and 50s are a great moment of the white outlaw. And outlaws seem to show that no matter how big this space is, no matter how big the big country is, the moment always comes when conflict becomes inevitable. And when that happens in many Westerns, what happens is that a town meeting is called. In high noon, it takes place in church. It interrupts the Sunday service. And uh, 12 people, 12, like a jury or the apostles, express their different opinions, including a woman who's the bravest of them all, the town's parsons, the sheriff's best friend, who will promptly betray him. And there are scenes like that in Man with a Gun, in Warlock, Magnificent Seven, in Shane, even in Stagecoach. The passengers at a certain point vote on whether to go on with the journey or not. These are very strange scenes for the Western because they're very articulate scenes. Uh, people uh, reason, they listen, they argue, they try to persuade each other. There is a palpably democratic atmosphere women speak and get to vote, even prostitutes get to speak and vote. But I think the ultimate meaning of these scenes is the impotence that they project over this kind of democratic discussion. Townspeople talk, but they will not arm themselves, and the silence of the man with a gun, who's often present at these scenes, usually standing by himself, alone, aside from the others, is a kind of scathing counterpoint to their verbosity. In terms of values, it's the decisive moment for the Western. It's the moment of violence. Why does the Western have such a hold on our imagination? As Robert Warshaw, um, an American critic of the Partisan Review, who died very young in the 1950s, he wrote a famous, uh, a few famous essays on uh, American film one entitled Movie Chronicle is mostly on the Western. And uh, why does the Western have such a hold on our imagination? Chiefly, he said, it's because it offers a serious orientation to the problem of violence, such as can be found almost nowhere else in our culture. One of the well-known peculiarities of modern civilized opinion is the refusal to acknowledge the value of violence. This refusal is a virtue. But like many virtues, it involves a certain willful blindness, and it encourages hypocrisy. My hunch is that there won't be any trouble, declares a character in High Noon. Not one bit. No trouble when there are four gunmen in town to kill the old sheriff. This is the civilized blindness Warshaw had in mind. And time and again, the Western contrasts it with the reality of violence. Someone begins by stealing cattle, robbing peasants of their land, farmers of their land, and of their product, then starts threatening, then starts killing, and then goes on killing. And so, sooner or later, violence has to be incorporated 
into the fabric of life. The Western is a foundation myth. It's a story of how a new social order comes into existence. And violence is placed as the cornerstone of that myth. Gentlemen, I'm putting the proposition to a vote, namely to employ Clint Tollinger in the capacity of a town tamer. Town tamer, not a marshal. Someone who's asked to shed plenty of blood. I wonder whether the patient will survive the treatment, comments the town doctor after the vote. High noon, the young Quaker wife picks up a gun and shoots one of the outlaws in the back. We know she's done it. We never get to see her face while she's shooting or afterwards. What will her life be after it? What would it have been had she not shot the man who was about to murder her husband? What is distinctly American it's not necessarily the amount or the kind of violence that characterizes our history. Richard Slotkin has written in a book entitled Gunfighter Nation, largely devoted to the Western. But the mythic significance we have assigned to it and the political uses to which we put that symbolism. In the Western, the main political use consists in making a certain kind of violence feel legitimate. It's really a form that legitimizes not all violence, but a certain kind of violence. Legitimate, first of all, because contained, as in these film's most uh, stylized scene, which is a shootout. In the shootout, conflict becomes geometry. Friend and foe, one in front of the other, walking towards each other in a straight line, with no noise, no disturbance, nothing between them. Distance is also stylized. It's not too close, but not too far. It's uh, the two move slowly towards each other. The great Western actors, John Wayne, Henry Fonda, Gary Cooper, one of their main acting features is the way they walk. Because the walk, especially in the scenes, is so crucial. They walk towards each other as if to calculate, as to find exactly the spot at which shooting can, become, can begin. It's almost like a dance. And in film noir, by contrast, one is shot by a few inches away, or often with the barrel touching the body, as uh, Stanwyck in. Uh, the Strange Loves of Martha Ivers or Mitchum in Out of the Past. And this gun touching the body is a, a sort of an echo, sort of the final sign of how treacherously intimate the stories of those films were. In the Western, shooters are far. They're 20, 30 steps away from each other. It's, it's a dimension, it's a kind of space that is almost immediately public. And it's usually in the town main street at midday. Public, in public also. The people of the town are often invisible. They're looking, but they're hiding. They're waiting to see who will end up ruling the town. They're waiting to see uh, for the fulfillment of Weber's famous definition of the state, a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of legitimate physical use of physical force within a given territory. That's really what the Western is about, creating a sense, creating a myth of the foundation of the state. What exactly makes a certain kind of violence legitimate? Well, this the Western never really explains, and its heroes who explain their behavior by simply declaring it inevitable. I have to stay. Someone always stays. I've got to stay. And so this is a formula that occurs over and over again. They really doesn't help much. <coughs> Legitimate, I would say, first of all, because the Westerner is characterized by a profound restraint on its impulse towards violence. 
He is the man who never draws first. And never drawing first is a way of signaling that his use of violence is always ultimately in self-defense. He reacts. He never initiates. And uh, this fact of this, is a, this kind of behavior, reactive rather than active, uh, connects him with the night of chivalric romance, with his never-ending crusade against the forces of evil. And in fact, the Westerners' um, endless uh, wandering, shame, materializing out of nowhere at the beginning of his film, and then uh, dissolving into the distance at the end of the film is indeed a modern version of the knight's uh, Quête de l'Aventure, the quest for adventure that was so typical. And uh, it's a muted version of the knight. Almost everything compared to chivalric romances is muted in Westerns. The shootout is a less bloody version of the sword and shield duel. The impossible adultery of uh, courtly romance is replaced in the Western by a Protestant absence or death of the object of love. And of course, in lieu of the haughty aristocratic beauty of chivalric heroes, we get the plebeian uh, plainness of uh, John Wayne and so on. Still, it's a miraculous compromise that the Western achieves between the long-term conventions of culture the long durée, one could say, of cultural conventions and a new democratic age between European conventions and a culture that famously lacked any aristocratic past. 1889, again, uh, this was really at the height of the Western as a narrative form. Mark Twain published a Connecticut Yankee at King Arthur's court. It's a very flat, very dogmatic story which proclaims the superiority of a 19th century engineer to the world of Camelot. And hence also claims that the modern world has absolutely no need for any kind of chivalric uh, value. The Western does the opposite. Is knights with uh, guns um, show that uh, some kind of military underpinning is inevitable, is necessary, even for the most peaceful kind of bourgeois. Right. Noir. Film noir also begins as an adjective. It was first used in France uh, for the serene noir of mostly American crime novels. And then, beginning in 1946, for films, even though erratically it was never used uh, consistently until the 70s or 80s. Noir. Shadows. Stanwyck paces back and forth in front of, uh, whoop, this is the Quaker wife in High Noon, by the way, and this is scenes from a duel. Stanwyck paces back and forth in front of McMurray, and with her stamped on the wall, paces her double. And in uh, The Third Man, which is a uh, uh, noir of, uh, shot in England, in, shot in Vienna uh, by an English director. Orson Welles has died before the story begins, he has been buried in front of our eyes, and then in a night scene, someone turns on a light and he appears from a dark awning, a sort of a shadow brought back to life. Later in the film, as the British military is waiting for him to show up at a rendezvous, uh, all of Vienna, so these are more shadows, as you can see this. They, shadows are used in, in many different ways. They're used to harden features, or they're used to highlight features, as in uh, the first image of Jane Greer in Out of the Past. And then I saw her coming out of the sun, and I knew that I wouldn't care about those 40 grams. And shadows literally reshape the world by showing it in a darker and equivocal light. And uh, later in The Third Man, as I said, uh, in a bravura piece in the middle of the film, they're waiting for Wells to show up, and all of Vienna turns into 
I see the right, shot. Duck. Clearly, a harmless. Um, maybe we should try to turn the lights down rather than up. Ah, well, okay, that's fine. And uh, um, this is clearly a homage to expressionism. Expressionism I had figured out uh, immediately the use Murnau Lang. Um, in 1923, there was a Schatten filmed in uh, Germany. The first movie theater in Rome was called Lux et Umbra, Light and Shadow. So it's, uh, if shadows, in other words, um, achieve for the visual aesthetics of the noir the same effect that ambiguity will achieve for its language. I would return to ambiguity in a few minutes. Uh, now let me uh, move to a comparison of the, in the treatment of violence between the two genres, because you know, the noir is clearly at least as haunted by death and killing as the Western, but the linear uh, perspective of the shootout is completely unthinkable here. The, the lady from Shanghai places Hayworth and Wellis face to face, looking straight into each other's eyes, a few seconds, and a third person emerges from their words. I thought it was your husband you wanted to kill. And the third person is then multiplied by Hayward's response. Well, George was supposed to take care of Arthur, but he lost his silly head, and so he shot Broom. They're alone, but they're not alone. Someone else is between them. In the duel, in the shootout, there is no one between them. Here, there is always someone in the middle. Few more seconds in that scene, and Arthur, Hayward's husband, shows up in person, and now it's he and Hayworth who are in front of each other, uh, their guns drawn, but the scene is set in a, sort of in a carnival space. There are many carnival spaces in the noir, and uh, this is specifically, it's, uh, it's um, a magic mirror maze, and in this space, as you can see in a particularly enigmatic moment, Hayward seems to be aiming directly at us. Uh, um, Arthur Sloan uh, is aiming in the same general direction, but he's refracted from so many different angles. He seems to be aiming at himself as well. You'd be foolish to fire that gun. With these mirrors, it's so difficult to tell. You're aiming at me, aren't you? I'm aiming at you, lover. And then they start firing, and glass shatters everywhere, and it's impossible to tell what's happening to whom. Then they actually hit each other and die, and yet we're left with this very baffling memory of a shootout framed within a triangle and with a, with a strange third spectator. And the point is, just as the linearity of the shootout was essential to the final simplification of the Western, triangulation is essential to the narrative structure of the noir. It's a triangle of adultery, of course, as indeed in The Lady from Shanghai, or 
in a moment in Gilda, which we'll see in a second. It's a scene from Gilda in which it's always Hayward, as you can see. This is her husband. This is her ex-lover. The husband doesn't know they have been lovers. And at a certain point, he will propose a toast. And uh, Glenford will look sort of surprised. And the reason is about 20 minutes earlier in the film, he has proposed the same toast to the three of us, meaning him, him, and the third, in that case, was a cane. It was a cane which, by pressing a button, uh, um, a knife would emerge from it. My little friend, as he calls it. And now he proposes the same toast, and whoa. And with a little luck. 50,000 pesos, and it's cute. Isn't she fabulous, Johnny? Fabulous. Wait, Johnny. Let's drink to us. To the three of us. To the three of us? What's the matter, Johnny? I get confused. Confused? Why? Well, just a few weeks ago, we drank a toast to the three of us. Well, who was the third one then? Should I be jealous? Hardly, darling. Just a friend of mine. Is it a him or a her? That's a very interesting question. What do you think, Johnny? A her. Oh? Why that conclusion? Because it looks like one thing, and then right in front of your eyes, it becomes another thing. Well, you haven't much faith in the stability of women then, have you, Johnny? That's right. One wonders who the woman was who brought our Johnny to this pretty pass. Doesn't one, Gilda? One does. Let's hate her. Shall we, Bella? Let's. Shall we, Johnny? Let's. Now that I'll drink to. Now, as I said, the third has certainly to do with adultery, but as uh, these two characters who've just come in who are part of a, a, another criminal plot reveal, it has to do with something also um, larger than that, which is uh, the social imaginary of the noir, and especially the, uh, the key figure of this social imaginary, which is, which we could call the third. There is a chapter in Simmel sociology on the sociological significance of the third element in which he says the appearance of the third party indicates transition, coordination, con conciliation, and abandonment of absolute contrasts. And uh, you can see how that could be, the third party emerging as a sort of impartial referee or as an institution that mediates and keeps conflict from, uh, um, from happening. In fact, it strengthens. Uh, social stability, the social bond. The point is, uh, if this, this may hold true in uh, many social structures, in the noir, however, the third plays a completely different role. It doesn't mediate, it multiplies conflicts, and it endlessly postpones their resolution. Here is Mitchum in uh, Out of the Past. All right, you take the frame off me. You, pan, you, you pin the eel's murder on Joe. You will be happier, by the way, if you let the cops have her. Somebody's got to take the rap for F Fisher's murder. Besides, it's not a frame. She shot him. I'll say you killed him. They will believe me. Do you believe her? You, me, Eels, Joe, her, Fisher, somebody, they. The starting point is again, even in Out of the Past, an adulterous triangle, but the real point is how it keeps expanding outwards, murder after murder. Here's double indemnity. You got me to take care of your husband, and then you got Zacchetti to take care of Lola, and then maybe of me too, and then somebody else would have come to take care of Zacchetti. That's the way you operate, isn't it, baby? The Western killing is definitive. It sort of highlights where the fundamental opposition is. It makes clear that once the enemy is dead, the story is over and the future begins. In the noir, killing is the opposite, just the first step in a series of ever-shifting alliances. 
Stanwyck and McMurray against her husband, then Stanwyck and Zacchetti against McMurray, then Stanwyck and someone else against Zacchetti, and so on. It's a narrative mechanism that's not invented by the noir that uh, probably goes um, yeah, that's nice for, for the film, but it's not nice for me. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a narrative mechanism that uh, goes back to the great metropolitan novels of uh, uh, Balzac and uh, Dickens, and uh, actually even earlier to Hegel's description of civil of bourgeois, or bourgeois society, the German Bürgerlich can mean both what we mean by civil society and what we mean by bourgeois society in the phenomenology of right. In civil society, each member is its own end. Everything else is nothing to him. Others are means to the end of the particular member. The whole sphere of civil society is thus the territory of mediation. The territory of mediation, it's on the surface, it sounds like Zimmel's transition and conciliation. It's actually the opposite because where everybody is a means to someone else's particular ends, then a new possibility arises, using others. Using others instead of simply eliminating them, as the Western tended to do. This creates a strangely intellectualized atmosphere. The noir is a much more intellectualized form, because using others requires more creativity than simply shooting them uh, down. And uh, on the one hand, it creates this intellectualized uh, atmosphere. On the other, it places the narrative structure uh, on an inflationary path. If the Western, uh, by and large, slims down, it sort of uh, uh, it eliminates characters in order to reach the final shootout between just two of them. In the noir, it's always possible to add another character, another character, another character. That's expanding the middle of the story to the detriment of everything else. Uh, there's a famous anecdote, uh, sort of a little legend, that during the shooting of uh, The Big Sleep, the Bogart Bacal movie of 46, no one could remember, the whole troupe, including uh, directors, uh, screenwriters, uh, no one could remember whether a certain character uh, who was found dead in a car had committed suicide or had been killed. And if killed, by whom he had been killed? So they sent a telegram to Chandler, who had written the novel. Chandler could not remember either. And the story is certainly false, uh, even though Chandler himself sort of uh, subscribed to it. But somehow, so it's absurd, it's incredible. But it really tells the truth, because there is a, a Ponzi scheme side to the structure of the noir sacrificing sort of long-term logic to immediate effect. And uh, this is why we're never bored watching the noir. There is always something unexpected that is bound to it. It's only at the end, when the whole thing falls down like a castle of cards, that one feels a little betrayed, a little uh, disappointed. So to speak. But somehow this was already so, uh, indeed in those great metropolitan novels, endings are the weakest point. For, Balz for different reasons, but for Balzac as well as Dickens. So the reduction of others to means to one's particular ends, it emerges first in the philosophy of right and then returns in a different work by Hegel, which is the aesthetics. The individual man must frequently make himself a means to others, must observe their limited aims, must likewise reduce others to mere means in order to satisfy his own interests. This is the prose of the world. This is a famous section. The prose of the world, a world of finitude and mutability, of entanglement in the relative, of the pressure of necessity from which no one is in a position to withdraw. The prose of the world. Holly, the world doesn't make any heroes, remarks Wells warily in The Third Man. And then, as if suddenly remembering that his friend Joseph Cotton is actually a writer of Westerns, except in your stories, of course. The Western needs heroes, has heroes, because it has no stable mechanism to enforce the law. The hero fills the void of the state. The hero is the state. In the noir, the state is perfectly solid. 
There is no danger to social structure as such. There are plenty of transgressions, of course, but they're always local. Stanwyck is a threat to her husband and a couple of lovers, not for everybody. This is not the, this is a difference between the noir and the gangster film. The gangster film is megalomaniac. The gangster wants really to run the city and eventually the world. The noir, it's much more modest and calculating in this respect. The prosaic mind, this is Hegel again, treats the field of actuality in accordance with categories such as cause and effect, means and ends, literal accuracy, unmistakable definiteness, and clear intelligibility. Accuracy and intelligibility. No other film genre uses blackboard as freely as the noir does. Bob Le Flambeau, great French noir, first explains the heist by using a blueprint here, and then takes the whole gang to a field where the building is on a one-to-one -one scale in order to make sure they understand what the plan is like. You have a brain like a pea. How did you get through school? I never set foot in one. I thought so. But Hegelian prose is not just you know, this uh, accuracy. It's not just precision. It's not just people performing certain definite duties at certain definite time as the mastermind of the killing puts it. Because the click between unfettered egoism and intellectual lucidity produces a cynicism all its own. This is, we'll next see another scene from the, from the third man. This is another carnival scene, by the way. And uh, um, the point is uh, Cotton and Wells have been friends in the past. Now Wells have become a black marketeer. He basically steals penicillin from hospitals, dilutes it, sells it at the black market, makes an immense profit, in the course of which a lot of, especially children, end up dying, and Cotton has just been taken to a hospital to see these children dying. And now he's meeting his old friend, and they have a conversation. <laughs> Exactly. Who did you tell about me? Hmm? I've told the police. Unwise, Holly. And Dana? Unwise. Did the uh, police believe you? You don't care anything at all about Anna, do you? <laughs> I've got quite a lot on my mind. You wouldn't do anything. What do you want me to do? Oh, you reason. Somebody else did expect me to give myself up. Why not? It's a far, far better thing than I do with the old limelight, the fall of the curtain. No. Holly, you and I aren't heroes. The world doesn't make any heroes. You've got plenty of kind of your stories. I've got to be so careful. I'm only safe in the Russian zone. I'm only safe here as long as they can use me. As long as they can use you. I wish I could get rid of this thing. So that's how they found out about Anna. You told them, didn't you? Don't try to be a policeman, old man. What do you expect me to be, part of oh, your... You can have any part you want as long as you don't interfere. I've never cut you out of anything. I remember when they raided the gambling joint and you were safe way out. <laughs> sure. Yeah, safe for you, not safe for me. Old 
man. You never should have gone to the police, you know. You ought to leave this thing alone. Have you ever seen any of your victims? You know, I never feel comfortable on these sort of things. Victims? Be melodramatic. Look down there. Would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spend? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax? Well, the only way you can save money nowadays. A lot of good your money will do you in jail. That jail's in another zone. There's no proof against me. Besides you. Dots. Would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could spare free of income tax? Many people would have fewer qualms at killing a man who was far enough to appear no larger than a swallow than in butchering an ox with their own hands. This is Diderot in the letter on the blinds. And physical distance functions here and in Diderot as uh, an equivalent, a proxy, for that absence of any kind of solidarity. Everything else is nothing to him, of Hegel's civil society. And it's a position so in icily clear-sighted that expressed by Wells here, that the noir never really knows how to counter these expressions. There are a few honest policemen in this genre, not perhaps even more than a few. There are plenty of insurance uh, uh, investigators who are usually even better, both as investigators and human beings as policemen, but they never have the same halo that the Westerner has. They represent legality, not legitimacy. And so when the noir finally finds a way of uh, countering, calculating egoism, it will be from a very different position. This is my last point about the noir. We're back to Gilda, and Hayworth, uh, uh, whose husband is the owner of a casino, um, is flirting with uh, clients, and Glenn Ford, who has the task of keeping an eye on her, has just grabbed her from the floor dance and is scolding her, or he thinks he is. What did you say to him? I just told him if the man answers, hang on. Wasn't that all right? You can't talk to men down here the way you would at home. They don't understand it. Understand what? They think you mean it. Mean what? Doesn't it bother you at all that you're married? But I want to know it. Does it bother you? It's uh, like a cartoon therapist. Hayworth uh, repeats exactly the words uh, Ford has uttered, uh, but in the formal question. As you say, what you say means so much more than you want it to. Uh, her words evoke what he's thinking and let it sort of hang in the air unresolved. It's really a verbal equivalent of shadows the shadow of what he was trying to say. And every time she opens her mouth from the first word she utters, it's a legendary me, which she says uh, at the beginning of the film, wherever she speaks, she introduces doubleness in language. Uh, think of the Western, by contrast, this inarticulate man who use their mouth in every possible way. They cough, they spit, they drink, they whistle, they yell, they chew, they chuckle, et cetera, et cetera. In every possible way, hardly ever for speaking. Laugh very loudly, but really have no idea what irony is. Words don't really matter in the Western. I must have quoted three or four sentences in the 30 minutes I devoted to it. The noir would be unthinkable without words, which is to say, would be unthinkable without women. Seductive because they make language seductive, suggestive, ironic, unstable. I don't like women, declares the killer of murder by contract. They never stand still. 
and they never let men stand still either. They stimulate desire, and desire is what finally counters and destroys the real politic of prose. Ethical values couldn't do that. There was no way of stopping egoism in the name of victims, in the names of ethics. Sex stops it. What are the two things in life you're more interested in, you are most interested in? The adulterous wife asks her lover in the killing. Money and women? Money and women. Trouble is that and is deceptive because desire interferes with accuracy and intelligibility and makes rational conduct impossible. And then I saw her, and I knew I wouldn't care about those 40 grands. Excuse me, officer, asked the professor of the asphalt jungle, the cold-blooded uh, uh, mastermind of the plan. Excuse me, who, who is caught because he's stopped in a bar to watch a girl dance. Excuse me, how long have you been out there? Oh, two or three minutes. Oh, yes. About as long as it takes to play a phonograph record. Sex and greed disrupt each other, or even they feed on each other with exactly the same result. In pushover, a police entrapment turns into an illicit affair, and then Kim Novak wants to turn it again into a murder plan. And McMurray's response, you win followed by a long kiss, makes affair and murder inexplicable. You handle accident insurance, as Stanwyck in the opening gambit of double indemnity. Accident insurance? Sure, Mrs. Dietrichson. And then in the same breath, I wish you'd tell me what's engraved in that anklet. Caught. We can already hear the office memorandum that frames the film. Yes, I killed it. I killed him for the money and for a woman. I didn't get the money and I didn't get the woman. Pretty, isn't it? So time to conclude. In a vast continent of heterogeneous immigrants coming from all corners of Europe, Perry Anderson has written of American culture in an article entitled Force and Consent, the products of industrial culture had from the start to be as generic as possible to maximize their share of the market. In Europe, every film came out of cultures with a dense sedimentation of particular traditions inherited from the national past, inevitably generating a cinema with high local content with small chance of traveling. In America, on the other hand, immigrant publics with weakened connections to heteroclite pasts could only be aggregated by narrative and visual schemas stripped to their most abstract recursive common denominator. The filmic languages that resolved this problem were, quite logically, those that went on to conquer the world, where the premium on dramatic simplification and repetition across far more heterogeneous markets was still greater. The universality of Hollywood forms derives from the originating task of American hegemony. Hegemony over the world market, planet Hollywood, but here, the counterpoint of Western and Noir, these uh, parallel lives in which everything is, is reversed, setting, pace, characters, language, plot. The parallel breaks down because the impact of the Western on world audience, and especially on European ones, has been incomparably greater than that of the Noir. At first, this seems strange, given that the Noir had been baptized in France and that so many of its great directors came from Europe. Lang, Van Stenberg, Wilder, Siodmak, Kurtitz, Preminger, Turner, Dassin, Simonman, Mamoulian, Mogui, and actually even more. Perhaps this is, however, precisely the reason. Post-war European audiences wanted something American in film, just as in music, drinks, clothes, dancing, and many other fields of everyday life. Film noir could be and was set in Berlin, London, Paris, Vienna. In a few years, a Frenchman, Jean-Pierre Melville, would emerge as its greatest director. The Western was thoroughly American. Even spaghetti Western had to pretend it was set there. Plus, the balance of hope and realism was perfect for post-1945 Europe. The hope of the frontier 
with its space that seemed to offer room for almost everybody, the realism of films that didn't elude the reality of violence, which for a generation that had lived through the war would have been absurd, yet invented a hero capable of somehow keeping violence under control. Much more than war films, the Western was the great post-war genre, not just in a chronological, but in a symbolic sense. Um, it managed to suggest a new mythical foundation for the use of force, and a myth which, in 1945 Europe, could only come with American features. It could not emerge from local cultures. It succeeded, if not quite in coming to terms with the experience of the conflict, no cultural form has ever been able to come to terms fully with the experience of the war, at least in represent the act of killing in a way that limited its scope and justified its use. Lucky the age that when the need arose, found a form that was capable of addressing its symbolic turmoil. Luckier, much luckier, the age that we have no need of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, at one point, you drew a distinction between law and legitim. Can you hear me? Yeah. At one point, you drew a distinction between law and legitimacy, and I was wondering if you could el elaborate a, a bit more on that, because in, in both genres, the lawman plays an important role, um, but different from the sort of Ur narrative that you that you seem to suggest informed the Western, that of the, the revenge, the, the chivalric point d'honneur, where the law is, as it were, authorized uh, or, or, or steps in to regulate, ultimately, uh, the, the, um, uh, the revenge between the two protagonists. Yeah, um, well, uh, you say two things. So, legality and legitimacy, the, the values clearly are contiguous and they overlap to a certain extent. But legality has a kind of positive aspect to existing laws. Legitimacy is the belief that existing laws are right. Hmm? Uh, it seems to me that the Western invests a lot of energy in defining laws that are right or behaviors that are right. The noir doesn't really care much about it. And uh, an evidence, uh, an aspect of that, which I have to skip to here, is that in the Western, at some point, a member of the field of good has to take arms and has to take responsibility for killing uh, whoever is uh, um, threatening the possibility of a reasonably fair social order. In the noir, this may happen, but actually what happens most of the time is that the bad guys kill each other. So in a sense, violence does not have to be assumed in the name of some kind of transcendent value. Uh, it just happens to serve the score. So it, it really, uh, in a sense, it's, uh, on, on the one hand, there is no, uh, no, emphasis on legitimacy, and on the other hand, there is no one who has to kill in the name of legitimacy. A very scary hiding has to kill in the name of something called legitimacy. Maybe one can find a better term for it. I use that in certain terms. 
she, she has to do that. Uh, and it's clearly both anguishing and necessary. Right? And then you weigh these two things and decide. In the noir, that's something that just doesn't happen. There is no need for it. The form does not have to solve that specific problem. It's not designed to, to do that. In that respect, it's a much more, it's much more kind of entertainment in my opinion. The logic of the story, which is extremely interesting in itself. Uh, yes, there was someone there, and then there's someone there. Well, someone here, then. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I have a question, I guess, about um, the kind of role of race in thinking about these genres and those under about race and those underlying structures, because there's, um, there's a lot of work on race um, in both the Western and the noir, right? So in the Western about the kind of bleaching of the frontier, which has to do with anxieties around um, immigration, right? And with that, the kind of sealing up of kind of gender roles. And then similarly uh, with, with film noirs, there's a lot of talk about um, the great migration and the kind of role of black labor in the North and anxieties about um, an integrating city and the kind of promiscuous women is being bound up in that kind of integrating city, right? So I guess one of my questions is, how does thinking about, how, where does race fit in thinking about both the kind of structures of these, but also kind of structures of law and violence, given how central those are kind of throughout this American, this history of the US? Yeah, well, um, okay. Um, so um, first of all, remember, um, my work here ends more or less around 1960, if not even earlier, a couple of examples. So certain thematics have emerged a lot less by then. One definitely has, which is uh, Native Americans. That is the prime example of race in, if race is the right word, which I'm not sure in the case of uh, the conflict with Native Americans in, uh, in Western films. And uh, what seems to me uh, uh, telling there is that usually the way Native Americans, Indians, are presented is, uh, is almost identical to the way Africans are presented in uh, colonial romances and many of these uh, adventure movies about Africa. That is to say, they are one and the same with the continental landscape. There is a chronic quality to um, Indians in Westerns. They, you can see them and not see them. At times, you know, you just see uh, billows of smoke or you see uh, arrows coming out of nowhere, exactly as in Heart of Darkness, the famous scene with arrows. And uh, uh, they very often seem to emerge from the ground and all of a sudden they're all there on the ridge or behind the leaf. So it's this idea that they are one and the same with the, with the nature of the place. So I would say that is the specificity of their presence as antagonists in the West. And whereas uh, white outlaws, which in my opinion play an even larger part as villains in Westerns, um, have none of those uh, characteristics. They're completely different. Um, some of these white outlaws uh, tend to um, have uh, some Mexican uh, features to them, or, uh, uh, but by and large, most of them are just as white, just as uh, American, as the white American, as the other American. The noir, at least the noirs I've seen, honestly, I would disagree with you. I don't see a lot of uh, presence of race. Immigration in big metropolises, of course, was, uh, uh, was a social problem in the US. Uh, but I don't, the noir doesn't seem to me to be uh, dealing with that in a, in a particularly uh, relevant way. So this is how I would see the two. And the women, the women, I mean, again, to me, they seem to be more cultivatedly white than the men in the world. At times they, you know, they may again have features, but you know, um, even the actress type is uh, tends to be um, rather 
sort of mainstream Y domain. Uh, is this on? Yes, it is. Um, thank you very much, first, for a, a wonderfully illuminating lecture. Um, I was very interested in the point you made relatively early on about the um, when you connected the Western with the chivalric romance. Um, and um, uh, it occurred to me, well, you could also connect it, you could go further back, couldn't you? Uh, and this is not an utterly original remark and um, relate the Western to um, Homer's Iliad. You actually mentioned the Odyssey, incidentally. But it's very Iliadic in all sorts of ways, again and again and again and again. And this thought came back to me when you were talking about noir. Um, uh, there, are, there are some crucial features, ignoring the uh, rather obvious technological feature of the Western. Um, uh, that aren't particularly modern and aren't even distinctively modern, and surely, and above all, that it stresses the scope of the individual for decisive action, um, which uh, you didn't quite put it this way, but I take it you'd agree that in the noir, the, the individual's always hemmed in. They can't, even if the individual actually sometimes achieves the particular individual, what that individual wants to do, you know, it's probably not the main individual. Um, and uh, it's always in a terribly constricted and almost sort of uh, accidental kind of way. The, the, the Western, as you've said, is extraordinarily straightforward. And when you've described the, um, uh, the stylized walk, the way that the, uh, the, the Gary Cooper, whoever it is, walks towards uh, the other, this, of course, is, again, very like the stylized confrontations in the Iliad, where, uh, um, weirdly, the, um, the two combatants fight in, in single combat, and one shoots, and the other patiently waits to see whether he's killed, and then if he isn't, he shoots back. Um, I mean, not obviously with guns, but with um, javelins, whatever, spears. Um, there's this extraordinary uh, stylization, which is, um, uh, as it were, not ancient, but it's ancient compatible. And yeah. whereas the noir seems to me utterly, utterly, utterly modern, you related it, and uh, this sounds quite, uh, I mean, entirely uh, right to me, to the 19th century novel. Uh, and yes, which is also quintessentially modern. You don't have that interiority uh, in antiquity. You don't, and with the noir, you don't have the, the claustrophobia. It just doesn't exist. There's no, no you, you uh, the, um, I mean, I'm almost tempted to say the Western seems to me almost accidentally modern, whereas the noir is quintessentially and inescapably modern. Very, very neat formulation. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, especially on uh, the remarks about the epic, you know, I briefly said that uh, you're completely right in a sense when I was saying, uh, you know, the Western is a foundation myth for say that is really what many epics also do, the American, uh, perhaps uh, uh, more than anything else. Only one difference there seems to me, and that's where uh, the relation to uh, the chivalric romance seems stronger to me. In the epic, in the Iliad, in the, the enemy camps seem to share most fundamental values. I mean, the fact that uh, for thousands of years, readers or listeners could have sympathized not with the Greek, but with the Trojan hero, is testimony to this fact. You watch a Western, it's very difficult to sympathize with the past. I mean, you can do it. Uh, by all means, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it can be fun, etc., etc., but it is not designed to put them on, uh, on a plane of things, right? There, there, is, uh, uh, there is an axiological 
difference between them than in many, certainly in India, uh, one doesn't recognize. Yes, I, I entirely agree. Yes. Thank you. Um, it, see, it seems to me that, um, and, and I, I wonder if this is correct, that, that you, you're sort of saying that the, 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 the Western and the film noir, which after all are pretty much contemporaneous, one is building up society and the other is tearing it down. So you have, you have the hero and the movement and the woman is, you know, they're going to settle down and have a family and a, house, a home and all those secure things. And then you have the guy stuck in a room with a very, very dangerous woman and, and, and society. I mean, you said it's sort of the, the walls are already secure and now it's time to tear them down. I think it's, how did that end up happening at the same time? Um. This is, this is a good question. I've uh, wondered about it, and I honestly uh, don't have an answer. I mean, there is a general answer, which is when we, when we think of a, of a genre, even of a text, but since I'm talking about genres here, let's say genres, when we think of a genre, we try to describe how it works, and then we try to figure out how its way of working relates to a larger historical moment, social space, etc. Right? Usually, we reason as if a single genre could be uh, uh, the key answer to issues of social structure. The truth is, at any given moment, in the history of literature, in the history of film, in the history of painting, whatever, there are several coexisting genres that are very different and that address different aspects of different interests and circumstances. Now, uh, so this is the general, the, the, it's not surprising that two very different genres could be contemporary. Um, the real question is there is no difficulty, like you seem to have no difficulty either, in understanding why the Western works. The problem is understanding why the noir works, I mean, what, what does it and this is a problem that uh, always uh, arises, which I think it arises in its most uh, crystal clear form in tragedy. Um, what do we do with genres that have no so to speak, positive uh, And uh, one of the answers that has been given for tragedy and could be the shape of the noir could be, well, cultures don't only need to see their problem solved. At times, they also need to see their problem laid out in front of them and presented as perhaps unsolved. Uh, mind you, there is a, the thing that the noir society doesn't solve this problem. The bad guys solve this So, you know, they pose a threat, but ultimately, the threat never materializes. And not because someone stops you, because they stop by themselves, or are stopped by accident, by chance, etc. In, uh, what is it, the killing. The hive succeeds, then the gang exterminate each other, there's only one survivor, and his girlfriend, they go to an airport, they have a suitcase full of dollars, and it's put on a sort of one of these cars that drives it to the truck, and there is an obnoxious old lady with a liver more obnoxious little dog, and the little dog gets scared, runs, and uh, the guy in order not to suit his balls. So, um, that is a pretty bloodless way of putting the story, but um, so this is, um, that, that's what I would say. You know, at times, you know, just uh, same question you could ask about nationalist novels, many of the noirs have a nationalist uh, ring in there. A sort of hopelessness. The Serene Noir was in the other hand, uh, and the first time Free Noir was used in a review, it had a nationalist overtone. So, you know, of course, French culture had always been particularly uh, open to nationalism. The idea that even in modern society, there is a destiny that no matter what you do, you can have a
done? Thank you.